at the village. Here at the village, to finish that statement, <laughs> we want to wish you a happy Mother's Day. So great. Isn't it a glorious day when we celebrate the ladies of our lives? I don't know if many of us understand where Mother's Day came from. Two different themes about Mother's Day historically. One is it was instituted shortly after the Civil War when the country was in great divide and they thought everyone could unite behind their moms, right? And say, okay, we're going to celebrate our moms. What a good thing that is. It's also rooted in the work of Anna Jarvis from Grafton, West Virginia, who uh, through the Episcopal Methodist Church there in Grafton, West Virginia, put together some workshops called, uh, the workshops were called Mother's Workshops, and it was about trying to decrease infant and child mortality. So it was teaching them about hygiene and all sorts of different things to enhance and enrich the lives of their children. So those are the, uh, those are kind of the two overriding themes about Mother's Day is unity and the enrichment of life. So moms, thank you for how you uh, bring us together and how you enrich our lives in wonderful ways wonderful ways. And all of us can live into Mother's Day by doing those two things, being unifiers and enriching life. Well, you know, we've been engaged in this series uh, entitled uh, Rejection. And, uh, and the series is really about trying to figure out what is it that exists within us that at times when we reject God in our lives. I know it's absolutely an amazing thought to think that a God who loves us so much is oftentimes rejected. So we're looking at different rejection stories in the scripture, trying to see what's happening there and then applying that to ourselves. Well, our story today is a story that revolves around dark times. It's about how do we stop the darkness that surrounds us from taking residence within us. Uh, you know, the definition of darkness itself, the definition of darkness is the absence of light. The slang definition of darkness, if you ever look it up in, in you know, the slang dictionary, is unpleasant. The very idea of darkness carries with it this idea of it being unpleasant. And we can get the idea of the unpleasantness through all the different times throughout our history that the word dark is used. Like, for instance, we're very familiar with the phrase, the dark ages. But you realize what the characteristics are of the dark ages? Everything was in decline. The economy was in decline. The intellectual culture was in decline. Culture itself was in decline. There was a lack of forward thinking. Everything existed in the past. And, and it, was a, it was a very controlling time. And, and, and that equals the dark ages. We can get an idea of, 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 of darkness, the sense of darkness, even through our music. Do you realize there are three songs since the year 2005 that are entitled Darkness. I think the latest one came out in 2018, right? And I think it was the joint work of Ed Sheeran and, uh, and Weekend. And, uh, and, and listen to the concepts that's attached to really all three of these songs in the lyrics of them so you kind of get a sense of what darkness feels like. In those songs is a theme of emptiness in our lives, being filled with hatred, running around in circles and not making any progress. In endless fog, there's no clarity about where we should go or what we should do, and making promises with no intention of keeping them. Those are all the themes in these three songs, darkness, and it describes a darkness that ultimately in these songs had taken residence in the people that the songs are about. Well, if you've been through dark times, you know the tendencies that we have. We isolate ourselves, we, we can feel hopeless, we become desperate. Well, you know, our, our scripture today is about a dark time. Our scripture today is about the crucifixion. 
And the crucifixion was so painful that, do you know, we even had to create a word to describe its pain. Anybody know what the word is that was, uh, that was, that was framed on the crucifixion in the English language? Excruciating. Excruciating. And you know what excruciating means? Out of the cross. That's the exact definition of the word excruciating. Out of the cross. Is there a more painful word or a more descriptive way to, uh, to, to describe pain than it is excruciating? Well, at the crucifixion, you know the story, there are two criminals. One hangs on the right and one hangs on the left of Jesus. They are thieves. They were wrongdoers. They were sinners. And they're hanging on the cross by a major road in and out of their capital city, Jerusalem. And they're hanging there for everyone to see. And here's the conversation that takes place. Luke chapter 23, it says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Then save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, uh, you will be with me in paradise. So let me ask you this question this morning. What does it look like when dark times inhabit us? I mean, more than when dark times surround us, what happens when those dark times take residence within us? I think we can have a few thoughts just from the simple words that the one thief on the cross says. Right, one thing that happens is we become very self-focused. Right? His phrase to Jesus was, hey, save yourself and us. Now, I can't help believe that the motivation of the thief on the cross was really his own salvation, his own momentarily relief from the pain in which he faced. But it's always interesting to me. Have you ever wondered, and, and, and you've been there, when, when, when you're in this conversation about God proving himself to you, do you ever notice it's always about God doing something we want him to do for us? Like that's how he proves himself to us? Oh, Lord, get me out of this. Oh, Lord, give me that. Oh, Lord, if you, I will then, as though his actions or his favors or the, or the tricks that he does for us proves his very existence. You know, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 says this. Whoever wants to save their life loses it. Is that interesting? I mean, the very desperation to save ourselves causes us to lose ourselves. And then Jesus says, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Hey, you know, one of the things that happens to us, I think, when dark times take residence within us is we become very self-focused, right? It's all about, it's all about the moment, and, and it's all about us, and it's all about what our desires or our relief is that we want. Another thing I think that happens to us during dark times is, is we become angry. You notice the thief on the cross, the scripture says, hurled insults at Jesus. Now, now I, I don't know. I, I, you know, so many times, right, that, 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 that when, you're, when your days are, are ebbing, normally, normally you would think generosity would come from you. Like here's this thief that's hanging on the cross that's under the same sentence as Jesus and the other thief, but, but instead of compassion or, in, or instead of concern, he hurls insults at Jesus. You know, that happens when dark times take residence within us. We become like insulting and, and somehow our compassion ebbs away. That's why I think uh, Paul is talking about getting rid of dark times when he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander with every form of malice. Don't let these reside in you because the darkness that surrounds us is beginning to take residence within us. 
Now, another thing I think that happens during dark times is that we can lose perspective on who Jesus really is. Now, notice this. Notice what the other thief says to the thief that was hurling insults. He says, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. So, so I want to toss this thought out to us, like when we're in dark times. And all of us have had dark times before. All of us have had things that have happened to us or things that have happened around us that we don't desire. That's a darkness. That's unpleasant. And I want to say this, that Jesus shows up in the midst of their darkness. Do you recognize this wasn't his darkness? He didn't go to the cross for anything he had done. He went to the cross for what you and I have done. He went to the cross for what these two thieves has done. Jesus joined them in the midst of their darkness. Jesus didn't create this darkness. Man, and, and at times when Jesus is with us in the midst of our darkness, sometimes we lose perspective of that because of the dark times and it taking residence within us that, that little do we realize this is not Jesus' is doing. Man, Jesus shows up in the midst of it to help us and to, and to care for us and to lead us and to guide us in the midst of those dark times. Well, I mean, right, Romans 6.23, it says this, for the wages of what they were about to experience for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is something completely opposite of that. It is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I tell you, in the middle of your dark times, just like these two thieves in the cross, Jesus shows up in the middle of your dark times. That's the way it's always been. Boy, read your scriptures. That's who he is. From the promise made in the garden, in the very beginning of time, when Adam and Eve have sinned and they're being tossed out of the garden and all of the results of that, who does God bring into the scene? He brings Jesus and the promise of redemption. Man, from the fiery furnaces of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who shows up in the fire? One like the Son of God, Jesus, to the manger in Bethlehem, to this moment on the cross. It's not his darkness. It's our darkness. But nevertheless, he shows up in the middle of it to love us, to care for us, to guide us in the midst of the darkness Man, and, and, and we have to push back on the idea that, that, that how we lose perspective of who he is because of the darkness that so often surrounds us and, and internalizes within us. Another thing that happens, I think, during dark times is, is we tend to live small. Like our world shrinks around us. I mean, the, the thief that was hurling insults Man, he was worried about the moment. And we may look at that and say, well, who wouldn't worry about the moment? Right? He's hanging on the cross publicly. And his, his life's ebbing away. He's going to die. Who wouldn't worry about the moment? But he's definitely thinking about this moment. But, but the other thief takes a different response. He's, he's not as concerned about the moment. I mean, the other while hanging there and being surrounded by the darkness had his perspective on a much wider kingdom. So his response to Jesus wasn't, save me in the moment, get me off this cross and get me out of this pain and change my current circumstances. His request was, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And his, his perspective was so much bigger than just the moment. But dark times that take residence within us can cause us to live just for the moment 
and not into the grand plans that God has for us. You believe that, don't you? I mean, God has grand plans for you. But when we live small, we think about today. We think about this moment. We think about what somebody said to us or somebody did to us or, or we think small, so self-smokest and, and small when, when the darkness has taken residence within us that we miss out on God's great plans for us. We get derailed. Jeremiah 21, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Greater, greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. But dark times do odd things to us, especially when they take residence within us. And I think maybe my last thought on, on what dark times tend to do to us is, is it tends to cause us to ask for the wrong things. We tend simply to ask for the wrong things. The thief on the cross was worried about getting off the cross and stopping the pain. Oftentimes, it's the moment that we cry to Jesus for when we should be asking, Lord, how can I fit into your greater plan? I know you're not done with me. I know it's not over. I know that whatever I'm experiencing and whatever I'm going through and whatever my loss is and whatever the pain is, I know that you have this plan to prosper me. Lord, what's your purpose for me? Uh, how did, how does, how Lord are you designing, you know, my, my, my future in the midst of this? What is it that you want me to deliver to the world? You know, Jesus came. He shows up in the middle of these two thieves to rescue them from the dominion of darkness. Do you know that's what the scripture says? You know, the scripture actually says that. That Jesus came to rescue us from the dominion of darkness. The kingdom of darkness. It's Paul's description in Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Listen to what he says. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Man, Jesus is here so that the darkness that surrounds you doesn't dominate you. Jesus is here so that the darkness that surrounds you does not take residence within you. Jesus is here that if the darkness has taken residence within you for his light to shine and drive out the darkness in you. I mean, the light of the world came so that you would not live in the darkness. And, you know, Paul goes on and he describes what the kingdom of light is like, right? The kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. This is what he says the kingdom of light is like. It's filled with knowledge and wisdom and understanding. It's where life is lived in a worthy manner. It's where you are strengthened with his power. It's where you display great endurance and great patience. It's where you express joyful thanksgiving. It's where you are redeemed and forgiven. That's the kingdom of light. So like, so like if you wondered how, like, like, like how do I keep the darkness from taking residence in me? Or if the darkness is in me, how do I, how do I, how do I get the darkness out of me. And there's probably a lot of thoughts we could talk about this morning. I'm really, I'm re I'm really only going to mention two thoughts to battle the darkness. The first is to embrace the big picture of what God is doing. You know, it was, uh, it was 41 years ago that I took my driver's ed class. 
41 years I have been safely driving on the streets of this uh, land. <laughs> now, some of the staff who've driven with me will question how safe it actually is, but, but I'm here. 41 years later, I'm still here. So, you know, somehow, you know, maybe it was more the safe driving of the people that surrounded me than my own safe driving, but nevertheless. But they used to use this phrase. I don't know if they use it anymore in driver's ed class. But they used to use it when I went to driving ed, driver's ed class. And it was always know the big picture. Did, anybody ever, ever, did you ever hear that? Anybody ever take driver's ed and they talk to you about the big picture? Keep the big picture in mind. Focus on the big picture. And you know how you focused on the big picture? You know what it was to keep the big picture in mind? You used all the elements around you to, to like, be aware of the big picture. Like for instance, you have a rear view mirror and you look in that rear view mirror to see who's behind you and how close they are to you. You use your side mirrors to see how close people are to the side. Every once in a while you turn your head this way or that way. You look through the windshield, right, this huge. You just use and you are constantly aware. And in fact, they even taught us a way and a pattern in which we should look to always be aware of the big picture. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm, Right? I mean, I don't know, maybe I was in remedial driving class. But I mean, like we sat there and there's a wheel in front of us and, and I'm sitting in a chair and they go, okay, here's the pattern. Look in the rearview mirror, look in the side view mirrors, turn, turn, look ahead. And you constantly followed this motion so that you could constantly be aware of the environment around you. Keep the big picture in mind. Now they did warn us. Don't ever be distracted by the resources that are around you or even the opportunities you can provide yourself when you're driving your car. Don't ever be distracted. Don't look in the rear view mirror only. Just glance at what's behind you so that you're aware, so that you know where you're moving to. But they would say this, right? And it made so much sense. Your rear view mirror is only this big. Your windshield is this big. And there's a reason, because you always want to be looking forward. You want to be aware of where it is you're going. You want to know where you've come from. You want to know what's behind you, but you want to be incredibly aware of where you're moving. They would say, don't pay attention to the radio. The radio does not matter. Can I say that again? The radio does not matter. In fact, somebody will say to me, hey, what music do you listen to in the radio? I'm like, I don't know. Most of the time for me, it's talk radio, right? Most of the time, it's sports. Most of the time, my podcast is working on my phone, and I'm listening to, well, you know what I'm listening to, like the greatest college football team in the history of <laughs> mankind. <laughs> so... That, that is an appropriate message because we're talking about coming out of dark times. <laughs> See, just a little slide note there, thank you. That, that wasn't even a plant. That was not even a plant. <laughs> but, hey, I've lived through some dark times. Not only am I a Buckeye fan, I'm a, I'm a Browns fan. So I know what dark times are like. So, but we don't have a, you know, when they talk about the Cleveland special, it's, a, it's like a hot dog with brown mustard on it. It's not a play that won the Super Bowl. But, but nevertheless, I mean, right? They, it, like, don't get distracted by the radio or fidgeting with the radio, or, right? And we've learned more with technology, so now all your radio controls are where? On your steering wheel, right? So you don't even have to, I actually, and I talk about all my safe driving, I actually did have an, an accident one day. I was much younger in my 20s. And you know why I had the accident? because I had dropped my cassette tape. <laughs> I do want you to know my very first car had an eight track player in it. <laughs> and it was old, I mean, the, well, the car was much older than I was, but anyhow, but, but I had dropped my cassette tape and I reached down to get my cassette tape and I rear-ended the car in front of me. I th so don't be distracted by the, you know, how about that little mirror in the visor? I mean, you know, you flip that mirror down and you, you, know, you flip down the visor and you flip up that mirror. And what are you doing when you flip up that mirror? You're not trying to see what's behind you. You're not looking at the big picture. You're trying to get the... Because you're hoping to see that special gal or guy, right? And you're like, you're picking away to make sure you're presentable. 
And right, don't be distracted. Uh, I mean, I mean, today our cell phones. I mean, I don't know how many times, right? People now have like these bumper magnets that say, get off your cell phone, stop texting, pay attention, right? Because our cell phones can be some such a distraction to us. Or, you know, the drive-through is a great invention. But my problem is, is every time I go through a drive-through, I can never wait till I get home to dig into the bag. You know what I'm saying? I get home and, and Dora's like, look, my fries are half empty. I'm going, I don't know why they always do that to you. <laughs> These crazy restaurants. What is going on? Mine's full, but... Now, I want you to, I want you to follow this thought. It only takes a little shift of your eyes till you lose the big picture. It only takes a moment for me to, and now I am unaware of what's happening to me. And the difficult thing is um, there's many of us that live life we're not way off. We're just a little off. And the darkness grows. And we're unaware. You want to know how one thief is hurling insults and the other thief is going to be in paradise that same day? He somehow, in the midst of all of his pain and all of the darkness and all of the things that surrounded him, he somehow was able to see the big picture. And we've got to ask the big questions. We've got to seek God's big answers in life. You know, Jesus didn't give in to the momentary pain or the momentary threat, or the momentary loss. Because he was doing something huge. He was saving the world. He was rescuing you from the dominion of darkness. He was saving the world. And, and it's incredible to think that he invites us in to that big picture of things where we become a part of that man I get it dark times are so confusing and I've been there I've been through dark times I've been through really dark times and and man I don't want dark times in my life they're they're confusing they're they they, they grab you and they rattle you and they and and right if and and, and man and, and if you don't if you don't have a if you don't have faith if you don't know who it is that you're serving and who it is you believe in, if you don't understand that, that, that he hasn't caused the dark times, but that he is with you in the dark times, if you don't understand that, it will mess you up. He's in those dark times to rescue us from them, not to deliver them to us. I mean, I want to say this. God is the God of life not death. Think about what our Bible teaches us, right? He's the creator of life. Our scripture says he's the sustainer of life. Everything about us, we move, we breathe in him. He desires for all of us to live life abundantly. Man, and, and he's on the cross because he is making life last forever. And, and you know who we are as God's people? We're people of abundant life. We're people of abundant life. Man, we're people that's like, whoo, man, Jesus can make a difference. Jesus is making a difference. Man, Jesus pushes back the darkness. Just when Jesus shows up, the light of the world, it drives out the darkness. I was thinking about this last night. You know, I knew I was preaching this morning, right? So I was thinking last night as I sat in this room, right? And I don't know. 250 plus folks were in this room and we celebrated the village Norristown. And, and I mean, there was a mariachi band and they were pretty good. And 
there were the kids from the village of Norristown dancing on the, on, the, on the platform in the stage. And we heard about all the great things that the village of Norristown is doing. And I thought, what a celebration of abundancy. The abundancy of our God. Well, like, how do we get there? How do we keep our eyes in the big picture? How in the midst of dark times do, do we not allow darkness to take residence within us? When the darkness is taking residence within us, how do we get the darkness out of us? Well, we, tar- we start by taking the steps that we, that we know. Right? I mean, we start by taking the steps we know. So we start to use the resources appropriately that God has placed around us. We start using group life. And we're like, I'm not going to walk through life alone. I'm going to walk through life with others. Other people that believe, other people that are, that are the kingdom of light people. I'm going I'm to be a part of them so encouragement comes into my life. And, and, and that I learn more and I grow more in understanding who this God is that we love and serve. I, I'm going to start giving myself away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start being involved in ministry in some way. I'm going to start showing up and, and giving back. And you don't have to have special gifts to show up and give back. Although the scripture says all of us do have some special gifts that we're to give back. But, but man, we can do that. We can just give back. And as we start giving back, it gets our eyes off of the self-focused and get our eyes on other focused. In fact, in fact, you know, when I, when, I, when I lived in Kansas, I did live in Kansas. That's probably why you think my, you know, that's why you, and your driving skills are still around because there's no cars in Kansas. But, um, you know, there was Minninger Clinic, Carl Minninger. You know what his main philosophy was to help with mental health? Serve somebody else. Give yourself away. Because the moment you start serving is the moment that your, your thought process begin to straighten out. You get your eyes off of what's happening in you and you get your eyes out into you. And it becomes an encouragement and an uplifting environment as you see the difference that Jesus is making in the world through you. Man, and, and you never know where, where God is going to take any of those things, but you do what you know to do, right? You use the resources around you. You get your eyes on the big picture. And here's the other thing you do. You trust Jesus. Now, there's a really powerful, powerful two words that's spoken on the cross. Right? It was the thief that wasn't hurling insults. It was the other thief. And the words were this. Remember me. Now, those are really thick words. Those are heavy words, biblically. The concept of remember me is all through the scriptures. Genesis chapter 9, God remembered Noah in the ark. And he remembered his covenant with him. Exodus chapter 2, when Israel was was in captivity. In in, in Exodus chapter 2, it says God remembered his covenant and he remembered his people. Psalms 105, it says, he remembers his covenant forever. The promise he made for a thousand generations. He remembers. Luke 12, 6, the words of Jesus himself who hung there that day on the cross. Luke 12, 6, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? You know what he means by that? Five sparrows are sold for two pennies. Sparrows aren't considered of much value in in this time. Five of them are sold for two pennies. Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. God remembers you. You are not forgotten you are remembered now now i don't i don't know where you're at today right i don't know if you're in the middle of darkness that swirls around you i don't know if there's things that have happened in your life or there's news you've heard or there's where this darkness is swirling i don't know if the darkness that 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 has swirled around you has taken residence within you i i i, I don't know that But I do know that in the midst of these dark times, 
there is one who has not forgotten you. And he is with you in the midst of that darkness. And he is there to transition you into the kingdom of light. So, so this morning, right, I, I would like all of us, if we would, just for a moment, just to bow your head and close your eyes. Man, I'm praying that the vast majority of, here, of us here today, that we're not experiencing dark times. That the darkness hasn't impacted us or hasn't begun to dwell within us. That, that, that's my prayer. That's my, that's my hope is that the darkness has not gotten a hold of us. But if it has, and you're one here this morning that says, yeah, some dark thoughts have come over me. Then I want you to know Jesus is with you in the midst of it. And he remembers you. And he desires to turn the light on with you. So this morning, I'm just going to ask us to say a prayer of, of trust in the Lord. Man, if you're a believer and you can name that dark time, man, give that to Jesus. Ask him to, to show you the pathway forward. Trust in him in the midst of it. And every time the dark time begins to grow again, man, reinforce your trust in him. Say it again and again and again and again. If you're here this morning and you've never prayed to accept Christ as your Savior, if you've never accepted that Jesus is who he said he is, then I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a word of prayer. But if you're here this morning and you're, man, I'd like to have the darkness lifted on me. Man, then, the man, just confess it. Confess who you are and confess who he is. And, and receive the goodness, the salvation, the grace, the mercy, the love that he has for you. Turn from those things that move you into darkness and turn to the things that steer, steer you towards the light. Jesus, I praise you, Lord. I praise you for the fact that no matter how the dark times come, whether it's just the darkness in the world that's got a hold of me, whether it's the darkness of my personal circumstances that's got a hold of me, or it's, it's the darkness of my own choice that's got a hold of me, you still show up. In the midst of the darkness, you still show up. You don't forget. You remember. And Lord, no matter how dark it is, that doesn't thwart the desire that you have for us. It doesn't thwart the plan that you've laid out in front of us. So Jesus, help us to recognize that plan and see that plan. Lord, help us to embrace who you are. You are our help in the midst of the darkness. Help us to embrace that. And Lord, lead us into those paths of righteousness. Lord, help us. I admit, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. You are who you say you are. I believe that with all my heart. And I turn from things that would lead me to darkness. And Lord, I want to turn to the King of the light. Thank you for your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy and your love. Thank you for the people that you put in my life that, that encourage me towards the light. That love me towards the light. That sometimes point out where I'm thinking in dark ways. Thank you, Lord, for all the different ways that you show up. And Jesus, help me to see you and embrace you all those times. Man, we love you, Jesus. We love you. And Jesus, in, in response to your goodness and grace, and we bring our tithes and offerings this morning, receive them. 
and know they come from people that want to join you in sharing your light in all of our community and world. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.